Hello, I'm Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at the University of Toronto. I'm head of the Mood Disorders Psychopharmacology Unit at the Universal Health Network and I'm Executive Director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation. My pleasure to welcome you to this course entitled Refining the Therapeutic Goals in Adults with Major Depressive Disorder. What we're going to do today is we're going to cover the impact of depression from the population health perspective and we're going to hear about the solo swan effect and the impact of the digital revolution on the solo swan model. We're going to talk also about cognition as a domain disturbance in adults who have depression and why it's important for us in fact to be evaluating cognition in adults with depression. I'll make mention of the recently published Medicaid Florida guidelines for depression and call to such action which can be identified on medicaidmentalhealth.org and we'll talk about what the implications are for long-term course and outcome in people who suffer from depression. We are in the midst of what's called the digital revolution. This is the third revolution to affect humanity. The first, in fact, being agricultural, the second being industrial, and the third now being the digital revolution. And all of us have, in fact, had a tremendous amount of uh, awe, if you will, at the impact that digital revolution deliverables have had on our day-to-day -day lives. In addition to having such an incredible effect on our day-to-day -day lives, everything as simple as the email to something like apps and uh, the use of now what's called 3D printing or additive manufacturing, there's been awareness from economists around the world as to how the digital revolution is affecting the global workplace. Now, back <clears throat> several decades ago, Robert Solow, who was professor of economics at MIT in Boston, uh, won the Nobel Prize for his observations of the correlations, the relationships between advances in technology, productivity, and workplace opportunities. Simply put, from a macroeconomic perspective, it's been observed during the agricultural and during the industrial revolutions that when there were advances in technologies, there was indeed an improvement or enhancement of productivity as well as workplace opportunities. The digital revolution, however, seems to be somewhat different, a decoupling of sorts of this correlation observed by Robert Solo, in the sense that we have advances in technology, clearly, and we're seeing in some sectors at least, not all, an increase in productivity, but what's abundantly clear is that the workplace opportunities have changed and in many cases gone down. Now part of this is due to globalization, and also in part this is due to automation, but also it's part of what's called the human capital economy. And we're seeing a shifting, not only in Canada, the United States, the OECD 34 nations, but around the world, the Arab League, the ASEAN League, uh, the ASEAN nations, the African League of Nations. It doesn't matter which set of nations or regions we're talking about, the global economy is shifting towards a human capital economy, at least for those who are performing best economically around the world. What this means is, is that the workplace demands cognitive capital. Therefore, disorders of the brain that adversely affect capital are, in fact, an encroachment and, in fact, endanger the full economic potential of the society, as well as, obviously, the individuals affected. So major depressive disorder is a common, often severe, and lifelong condition. It affects human capital largely by diminishing cognitive capabilities. In order to perform in today's workplace globally, the skill sets one requires are cognitive and complex, rather than simple manual. And this is a major shift which has implications for us in psychiatry. It is in fact achievable and it is in fact strongly stated that we should be achieving full functional recovery and depression. And functional recovery and depression is the overarching therapeutic objective. It is achievable. It's achievable in most patients. Unfortunately it's not being achieved in part because of deficiencies in the screening, the diagnosis, and the uh, uh, appropriate selection and uh, treatment of people who have depression. We also know that in part many people are not achieving the goals that is full functional recovery because they do not have sufficient improvement in cognitive domain disturbances in adults who have depression. We know from plenty of evidence that's been published uh, in the academic biomedical literature that disturbances in the cognitive domain in adults who have depression are common. In fact, they represent a criterion item. What I think is striking is that cognitive symptoms in depression are not just common, but they persist, even when the mood symptoms seem to have abated. What we've also noted is that cognitive symptoms in adults with depression persist 
are often a principal determinant of overall adjustment in society, that is, working with their families, being with their friends, and also performing in the workplace. Our group in Toronto, with collaborators at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, published a report wherein we showed that disturbances in cognitive function amongst adults with depression is a greater determinant of overall workplace adjustment and productivity than is, for example, their overall depression symptom severity. In other words, we know that work is not just about making a paycheck, it's also about a sense of uh, uh, structure to our day, a sense of efficacy to who we are in agency, but also, in fact, a sense of validation. Workplace is an extremely important uh, domain of human function. And we know that for people to be awfully functioning in that workplace, they need to have full cognitive abilities. What I think is, in fact, so critical about our observations, which have been replicated by the groups, is that in addition to improving depressive symptoms, it's critical for us also to improve overall cognitive symptoms. Now, how do we do that? Well, I think, in fact, that the best way to improve and preserve cognitive abilities in someone who's been affected by depression is to prevent the problem in the first place. And we know that people who have depression often have what we call comorbidities, both psychiatric and medical. In other words, other psychiatric and medical problems that may affect them at the same time while they're depressed. For example, we know that alcohol use, if excessive, can interfere with cognitive functions. We also know cannabis use can also interfere with cognitive functions. So it stands to reason that these other uh, domains or other disturbances would need to be addressed in someone who's looking to have full functional recovery in depression. We also know that people who have major depression, or bipolar disorder for that matter, are differentially affected by episodes coming back. In other words, these episodes are prone to return over time. These are, in many cases, lifelong illnesses, but not always. And we know that with each episode of depression, an individual has a further decrease in their cognitive abilities. So it stands to reason, then, that along with improving the psychiatric comorbidity, it's also important for us to prevent relapses and recurrences. One of the most important observations in neuroscience in the last 10 years is the observation that obesity and diabetes could adversely affect the brain. It is true that obesity and diabetes do metastasize to the brain. Now, I'm being somewhat metaphorical as I say that, but what I really mean by that is if we look at the structure, the function, and the neurochemical uh, composition of the human brain, people who are obese or are experiencing excess weight or, for that matter, diabetes, we see changes. We see changes that have implications for, among other things, cognitive abilities. For example, it's well known that type 2 diabetes is a proximate cause of Alzheimer's disease in up to 10% of cases. We know among younger people, between the ages of, for example, 20 and 65, who have depression, if they have obesity or diabetes or both, they're more likely, in fact, to have a decrease in their cognitive abilities. We do believe that the uh, mechanism that links obesity and diabetes to the brain involves such uh, mechanisms as inflammation, as well as disturbances in insulin signaling, which is a critical brain peptide or brain uh, protein, and also disturbances in other aspects of brain function, such as cellular bioenergetics. These uh, areas, which we call effector systems, are all under active scrutiny by our group and others to further parse and understand what is their role in the pathogenesis and the treatment of brain-based illnesses. It's not without our interest that bariatric surgery, otherwise known as weight loss surgery, is associated with significant improvements in cognitive abilities. This provides for us an interesting proof of concept that there's something about excess weight and specifically adipos adiposity or adipose tissue that is adversely affecting the brain. Recently, the USA Florida Medicaid guidelines have been posted on uh, MedicaidMentalHealth.org. MedicaidMentalHealth.org houses not only the guidelines for depression and bipolar, but also uh, houses guidelines for other areas, such as uh, uh, depression in women and peripartum matters, as well as uh, depression as it relates to children. On the topic of depression in adults with major depressive disorder, the USA Florida Medicaid guidelines make a very strong statement that amongst all people who have depression, along with some of the guiding principles of assessing for suicidality, hypomanic symptoms, anxiety disturbances, and comorbidity, we also should, in fact, in each and every patient, be evaluating them for cognitive 
dysfunction. They should be probed specifically about disturbances in this particular area. How do we measure depressive symptoms in people who have depression? Well, we measure depressive symptoms with a metric. And there are many metrics that are validated across different languages in different cultures around the world. One of the better known instruments is known as the PHQ-9, the Patient Health Questionnaire 9. Another tool is known as the QUIDS, or the Quick Inventory for Depressive Symptoms. There are many other uh, rating scales that are available, many of which are free of charge. And they have been shown, when included in day-to-day -day practice, to improve therapeutic outcomes in depression. It helps us sharpen the focus, quantify outcomes, and I think provides a much more precise conversation with patients. Unfortunately, one of the limitations of most of the depression scales that we currently have in depression is they don't provide sufficient evaluation of a patient's cognitive abilities. First, they don't have many items that are dedicated to evaluating cognition. Secondly, they don't capture what we call the ecological validity. In other words, they don't capture the complexity of the circumstances wherein cognition affects people in their day-to-day lives. And then finally, the available rating scales for depression, such as the PHQ-9, are asking people from their own perspective what's their cognition like. And we know that self-rated cognitive function is a critical measure but it doesn't correlate, at least at the baseline, with objective cognitive measures. So we need a screening tool, we certainly need a measurement tool, and also a symptom tracking tool for cognition. And again, as I state, we do not in fact have sufficient evidence that the available depression metrics are appropriate. I want to also emphasize a critical point, and that is that the screening tools for dementia, well known to all of us, such as the mini mental status exam, better known as the MNSE, or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, better known by its acronym, the MOCA, are very good screening tools, at least to a certain degree, in screening for dementia in older individuals. But for assessing cognition in younger people who have depression, these tools are simply not sufficient. My colleagues and many others are, uh, who are part of a, a task force known as the THINK Task Force have prepared a new neurocognitive measure, which we call the THINK IT tool. And the Thinkit tool will be fully validated and be available as of July of 2016. This tool, which is originally being validated in English in adults with depression, will be validated in many different languages around the world, including but not limited to Spanish, Korean, Chinese, German, and others. So we're looking at validating this tool and making this a everyday uh, assessment as part of good clinical practice. It's important to underscore that the Thinkit tool will be free of charge. That's a price that most people seem to like. It's accessible, it's available on the internet, you can download it, and it's digitalized, and patients can play it in the waiting room, and will get a result right away on their smart device. So going forward, we do believe, in fact, that people who have depression should, in fact, be assessed with a depression tool, and should have their cognition assessed with a validated instrument, and the Thinkit tool will provide just that. How do we go about treating cognitive dysfunction in people where we really address some of the moderating factors I spoke to earlier, such as number of episodes and comorbidity? Well, I do think, in fact, it begins with behavioral approaches. I think uh, attention to sleep hygiene and sleep organization, sleep efficiency is critical, given what we know about the relationship between sleep duration, disruption, and circadian rhythms and overall cognitive abilities, and certainly psychopathology in general. It's a hypothesis that sleep disruption interferes with cognition via effects on insulin signaling, as well as inflammatory processes. So it begins with good sleep, good sleep hygiene, good daily schedules, I think appropriate management of stress for people through supportive interventions and or through a structured uh, psychotherapy like cognitive behavioral therapy. We also have a behavioral activation, which is a way of putting the behavior ahead of the thought. In other words, getting people going again seems to be also a mechanism wherein we can really improve not just people's function, but hopefully with uh, secondary effects on their ability to think and organize. There's a lot of interest these days in some of the other modalities of therapy, like aerobic exercise, dietary manipulations, maybe even effects on the gut microbiota and gut microbiome to name a few. And these are areas we are very interested in, and our group in Toronto and other groups around the world are exploring this. Other approaches, such as neuromodulation with transcranial magnetic stimulation, hold promise but are not yet unequivocally established. And we are certainly looking at uh, approaches with some of the newer treatments that are coming uh, in the pipeline for depression that are receiving a lot of attention, 
including such treatments like rapastinil and ketamine, to name a few, which are not ready for clinical usage, but are still in fact being studied. Our group in Toronto and others are looking at the role of anti-inflammatory agents, even repurposing anti-diabetic agents as a way of improving cognition in depression and other psychiatric disorders. And finally, amongst many of the antidepressant medications that we do have, we're beginning to see some differences between the antidepressants in their ability to have a direct, independent, and clinically relevant effect on cognitive functions. Finally, let's not forget well-known psychotherapies like cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal psychotherapies, to name a few or name a couple. These modalities of therapy have been shown to improve cognitive emotional processing to some extent, at least the way we understand cognitive emotional processing, that being disturbances in so-called cognitive schemas, as evidenced by rumination, uh, negative reactions to real or perceived sights, and really, in fact, as, an, as, as a tool to really improve a person's interpersonal and everyday psychosocial functioning. I think it still stands to be tested whether or not CBT and other structured type therapies, including mindfulness, have direct effects on cognition, independent of their effects on mood. I think a viable and test like hypothesis could be made that they do. We look forward to seeing some results of studies that are underway with this modality, as well as with cognitive remediation, another psychosocial intervention shown to improve cognition in other uh, psychiatric disturbances like schizophrenia and autism. So if I could just summarize, what we're looking at in depression today is a common and lifelong condition. This is, in fact, the most disabling condition to humanity. And it's a condition that is costly to the individual and society at large. We are in a digital revolution. And it's important for us to be aware of what's happening in the public square. Because the digital revolution is changing workplace opportunities. It's changing so much about our day-to-day -day lives. Our uh, skill sets that are required to engage that society are complex and cognitive rather than uh, more simple and manual. Therefore, disturbances in brain that affect our ability to be cognitive have implications for that person's role functioning as well as society at large. This is why we believe that targeting cognition in people who have depression not only, in fact, is uh, uh, relevant given how common these symptoms are, but has implications for overall patient-reported outcomes like quality of life and function. And we believe strongly that we can target this domain. Uh, we believe, in fact, we can improve the overall human capital of people who are affected by depression. It starts with evaluation. It moves into screening. We're going to have to think a tool available very soon. And it'll be available to be downloaded from our website, known as the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation website, as well as the Think website, also on the internet. Then we move into prevention and moderating factors, as well as a whole disparate assortment of behavioral, psychosocial, lifestyle, maybe dietary, and also possibly pharmacological treatment for cognition in depression. I thank you very much for joining me for today's course.